the 19th century experiences two opposing movements. As Romanticism wanes, realism emerges as a reaction to it. If a Romantic thinker indulges in the idealized landscapes and musings about dreams of the subconscious, a realist thinker is asking us to open our eyes and examine what is right in front of us. Stop looking at that wheat field through rosy lenses. There is no rainbow. There are impoverished men and women of France breaking their backs and toiling their sorry lives away. With that said, be aware of opposing philosophies of Charles Darwin and Karl Marx. Many realist painters will prefer the ideas of Karl Marx, who wrote the Communist Manifesto. Artists like Daumier and Millet are watching their fellow Frenchmen get poorer while the rich get richer. A government that spreads the wealth more evenly sounds like a great solution to them, and they use their art to make viewers sympathize with them. The goal of the realist artist is to show the contemporary being in its contemporary context. Here, Gustave Courbet shows us two Frenchmen breaking stones. This is their job, day in and day out, for their entire existence. We see two generations of this life that never seems to end with dismal colors and torn clothes. The figures are isolated in the scene, so we are forced to focus on their labor. The piece is called The Stonebreakers. It was made in response to a French worker rebellion that demanded better working conditions. Gustave Courbet is reacting to a contemporary invent, just like the Romantics like Jericho did when he painted the raft of the Medusa. The difference here is that Jericho romanticized his work by adding rolling storm clouds, dramatic lighting, and theatrical poses. It was like an epic film. This piece, in contrast, is not exaggerated. It is not exciting or dramatic. It is the cold, hard truth of 19th century France. The artist is challenging you to stop what you are doing, open your eyes, and look at what is right in front of you. Gustave Courbet is also known for his self-portraits. He enjoyed exploring his own identity by painting different aspects of his own personality. Gustave Courbet also painted this piece, known as the Burial at Ornans. It depicts a poor person's funeral, but ironically, Courbet decided to paint it on a 10 by 22 foot canvas, as though it were a glorious historical painting, showing us a great and memorable event. Paintings like this one are typically done at this size and in this manner. This shows us the death of General Wolfe. If you remember this from the neoclassical period, the military general is dying a noble hero's death as the clouds swirl about dramatically and the surrounding characters swoon with great expression. The burial at Ornans, in contrast, shows us a jumble of townspeople who stand statically and at relatively the same height across the page. They wear the clothes they wear every other day, and they are as dull as the weather in the sky. The Christian cross is small but present, alongside a crudely dug hole where the recently dead will spend eternity. Some of the children aren't paying attention, and others seem to be already leaving the scene. Casual, non-ceremonious, dreary reality of this shocked viewers, just as Corbet intended. If we compare these two country landscapes, you should recognize John Constable's Haywain, with the puffy white clouds against the blue sky, and cottage nestled comfortably into an idealized landscape in a twinkling lake. We want to be here. 
The man working in the hay wain, which is a cart, is not working. He is small and appears to be another idyllic piece of the landscape. The new piece is called The Gleaners by Jean-Francois Millet. Millet has similar goals as Courbet. He shows us impoverished women coming to glean the remaining bits of the harvest after the bulk of it has been taken by the wealthy landowner. They are faceless, so their anonymity allows them to easily represent the country poor as a whole. They are statuesque and almost noble. Millet does not want us to be disgusted by them. He wants us to see them as struggling heroes. Many saw this as a push for socialism, and rightly so. In the same vein, Honoré Daumier, notice the HD in the bottom left, will use his talents to force us to look at France's reality. Here we move from the country to the city. The scene shows the aftermath of a brutal massacre in an apartment building filled with poor urban workers. One of the building guards was shot by a rebellious worker, and the rest of the guards retaliated by entering each apartment and killing each and every resident. The man in the light has been dragged from his bed. He wears his nightcap and is clearly unarmed. What do we see underneath him? A baby? And to the right, an elderly man? It is one thing to read about this in the news, but Daumier has created a powerful visual for his cause, and he took it a step further by creating it in lithography rather than oil. The printmaking method allowed this image to be spread quickly and cheaply. Daumier also painted the third-class carriage. Again, we see the urban poor but this time they are crammed onto the only section of the train they can afford. The air appears yellow and filthy as the woman on the left nurses her baby. Their faces are deadened, as though they've accepted the drudgery of an existence they cannot seem to change. There are many different realities explored in the 19th century. This piece by Edouard Manet is called Luncheon on the grass. Who do we see eating lunch on the grass? There are two men, dressed rather well. Perhaps they are part of the bourgeoisie. But who do they dine with, casually, in a public park? A woman, in the nude. She doesn't look away demurely. She doesn't look at us seductively. She stares at us unapologetically. Prostitution was another harsh reality for many of the poor in France, an occupation that some felt could not be avoided. This woman challenges you to look at her difficult choice. This is the life France has forced upon her. Don't look away at an easier painting, like the one represented by the romanticized image of a woman in the background. Stop and consider this reality. The model here is, in fact, a prostitute, but she is Manet's favorite model. He used her in many paintings, and her name was Victorine. Manet also used his brother in this piece as one of the models. Here is Victorine again, and Manet has not given up on his intentions. At first she may appear to be another reclining nude, but upon further inspection we realize she is not interested in hiding her occupation. The title itself is Olympia, which was a common name taken by prostitutes. Her pose is not demure like the romanticized grand olesque below. She lays on the bed casually as an African servant brings her flowers from a client. Again she stares at the viewer, boldly challenging us to look back at her reality. If we compare the way Manet paints her flattened white skin to the soft modeling shadows on Grand Odalesque, we can see how Manet was criticized in this regard as well. He doesn't make her pretty. He doesn't elongate her limbs or make the scene 
any easier to look at than it was in the room he sat in while painting it. Some artists chose to focus on a different reality, specifically the reality of anatomy and movement. This is less of a social reality and more of a visual reality. Rosa Bonheur, who was considered the most celebrated female painter of the century, was particularly interested in the anatomy of horses as she paints the annual horse fair in Paris. She studies the movement and musculature and ironically captures some of the romantic drama of the romantic painter Jericho, who greatly influenced her work. Compare the sense of movement and the drama in the sky in these two paintings. While we've spent most of this movement in France, here Winslow Homer gives us a simple portrait of America's reality. The Civil War is over, and not only has the nation lost Abraham Lincoln, but thousands of loved ones who fought their neighbors in a long, bloody war. The man here has returned to the fields where he attempts to re-engage in everyday life. Again, we see an artist intentionally presenting us with a faceless figure, so that he may represent all Americans existing in a quiet, mournful, post-war environment. The scythe he holds is prominent and reminds us of the theme of death that defines America's mood. Thomas Aikens is a realist, much like Rosa Bonheur, in that most of what interests him is a visual reality. He is interested in anatomy and movement. He paints rowers on the Schuylkill River, studying the way the morning sun highlights their muscles in motion. Here, he paints Dr. Gross performing a surgical lesson for doctors in training. The patient's mother hides her face on the lower left, but the patient himself is probably just fine. One doctor holds a rag over his face, administering anesthesia, which is a new standard in the OR. Of course, this is not an OR. It is a very unsanitary lecture hall, with men dressed in suits rather than scrubs. Dr. Gross was not a believer of the superstitious talk of invisible germs that contributed to infection. Aikens was a great Philadelphia portrait artist, painting many prominent Philadelphians. This piece was owned by Thomas Jefferson University Hospital until a few years ago, when they needed money and tried to sell it for $68 million. Philadelphians were horrified at the thought of this iconic piece leaving our city so anonymous donors put their funds together to purchase the piece from the hospital and it's now kept at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Here are some other Thomas Aikens portraits. And now enjoy this smart history presentation on John Singer Sargent. It's done.